interested in the emotional landscape of tragedy and trauma. It was the subject, of course, I taught this past semester at the University of Montana <laughs> Journalism School. We studied what goes on in someone's brain when the unthinkable happens and how to do justice to a survivor's story without doing harm. The name of the seminar was The Worst Day Ever, Writing About Trauma. I want to begin by telling you about my family's worst day ever. I grew up in Missouri in a family of five with two brothers, Jim and Jack. I adored them both, and they thought I was okay. We were the three J's and inseparable, or so we thought. When I was 23 and just two years out of journalism school, my older brother Jim was in an airplane crash. He was 26, the navigator in an Air Force jet that went down in a snowstorm in a mountainous area of Utah and Nevada border. Because of the weather conditions and the remote location on a reservation, the Air Force struggled to get to the crash site. And during that time, my family, we held on to a desperate hope that he had survived, that he had safely ejected from the plane. We waited two days to learn that he was gone, and two more for them to bring him home off the mountain. When the news came that he was dead, the phone rang in my parents' house outside Kansas City, and I picked it up. On the other end was a reporter from the Kansas City Star. He told me he wanted to know more about my brother, but he also wanted to get details of the crash that the Air Force wouldn't give him. Was the weather the cause, he asked me, or did your brother or the pilot make some fatal error? Now I understood the job he was doing. He was after a story like so many others, a headline that marked an ending. The end of the search, the end of my brother's life, and the end of our hope. But sometime after that day in the years that followed, I came to understand something, both personally and as a journalist, and that was that with every headline that marked an ending, a new beginning was about to unfold. And those were the stories I became interested in telling. A farmer dies one Christmas when his house burns to the ground. What will the farmer's wife and children do? Give up farming and move to town? Or rebuild their home and plant the fields come spring? A young woman, driven to succeed, buckles under the pressure and tries to take her life. 25 years later, what has living taught someone who once thought death was a solution? These were stories I assigned early in my career. They sprung from tragic headlines, but they told the stories of new beginnings. Now, fast forward 40 years, my career has pretty much spanned the modern history of journalism, from uh, news stories pecked out on typewriters and thrown with a thud onto your front porch steps, to the deafening, seemingly inescapable 24-7 news cycle. It assaults us on all fronts, online, on air, and in print. For 10 years, I worked at CNN Digital, the number one destination for online news in the world. It sometimes felt like a 24-7 job. I was an editor dispatching reporters to places all over the globe where terrible things had happened. 
Now, my team was not the first responders bringing you the headlines of the day. They were in search of those aftermath stories, stories that would introduce you to the human beings who suffered and survived. Sometimes they would return to report on those people again and again. Like the three-month-old Iraqi baby whose disfiguring birth defect threatened to take her life. After all, the professionals and the doctors in the country had fled because of the war. But soldiers patrolling in the neighborhood of Abu Ghraib discovered her and got her to America for life-saving surgery. The world came to know her as Baby Noor, a rock's miracle baby. The reporter, Moni Basu, she would return to Iraq many times to chronicle Noor's journey. The last time she saw her, Noor was 11 years old. Another rider was dispatched to the Orlando Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, where he told the quiet story of a man who knew 17 of the gunman's victims. 17. Can you imagine? He was six foot nine and built like a redwood, John Sutter wrote. Everyone called him Tree. Now, while the gunman had targeted his victims for exactly who they were, gay and Latino, this was a story about acceptance. Tree was a straight man who had met his friends by working as a bouncer in another gay bar. They accepted him for exactly who he was when others hadn't, John wrote. They looked past his nose ring and his size 19 shoes. They didn't tease him about his height or his weight. They didn't make him feel like a freak or an ogre. They knew what it was to be judged unfairly. Let me be clear. These stories did not erase or deny the suffering, but they seemed to us as, as important to bring to you as the headline news. They were a fuller, really more accurate picture of human suffering and recovery. They weren't just informational, they were experiential. They touched the heart as well as the head. Recently, I stepped away from the newsroom to focus on teaching and editing books and really, I consume the news for the first time in my life more as a citizen than as a journalist. So, I get it. I understand that instinct to escape that barrage of bad news, to turn off the TV and shut down those social media feeds and try to go about life a little more ignorant but more blissful. I was not surprised to learn that this word, doom scrolling, was entered into the Oxford English Dictionary in 2020. I mean, it was a year in which we binge watched the world in crisis. What I was surprised by was some of the research I uncovered while preparing to teach this course on what experts call trauma informed journalism. I'm going to share some of this research with you tonight. And I'm going to make this argument. I want to argue against rubbernecking, which is really what we do, glancing at tragedy and moving on, and on behalf of pulling over and looking deeply. And here's why. Research shows that the traumatic and the tragic are avenues to connection and compassion. What more could we need in this troubled world? Who here has been touched by trauma? I can see you, quite a few. Well, if trauma hasn't found you yet, it will. Trauma tracks us down. 
Studies estimate that as much as 80% of the population has experienced a traumatic event. And these are pre-pandemic numbers, so imagine. Exposure is so extensive that the psychiatrist Sandra Bloom calls trauma a central organizing principle in the formation, maintenance, and growth of human society. In other words, trauma is central to our existence. It is also central to journalism because it's the journalist's job to inform to give voice to citizens. And sometimes this means telling those stories of tragedy and recovery. I confess we have not always done it well. But there has been a movement in the profession to make the news of the tragic and the way it's reported better and more humane. How long should a TV anchor repeat the name of a gunman? Should a website lead with a picture of the killer or the faces of the victims? These are questions that were raised by a couple whose son died in the Aurora Theater shooting in 2012. Their campaign was called No Notoriety, and it was bolstered by research that showed that there is an existence between mass shootings and copycats. Because of their campaign and that research, many news organizations began to limit the number of times they would use a gunman's image or name. Chris Vanderveen is a director of reporting at a TV station in Denver, KUSA Channel 9. And Chris was a young reporter in 1999 and covered the shootings at Columbine High School. Years later, he documented that carnage in the Aurora Theater. And just this past March, he led a team of reporters when a gunman killed 10 people at a supermarket in Boulder. Chris told me that Aurora transformed his newsroom. Here's what they did. They invited into the station the family members of victims, not for a story, just to listen to them. We wanted to know what we could do differently, Chris told me. How could we as journalists learn not to add to the grief? There's an organization called the DART Center for Trauma and Journalism. And guided by that center, the profession has now really shifted focus from the disaster to the aftermath, from the perpetrator to the victims and survivors and first responders. There's a psychiatrist named Frank Ochberg, who is an expert in treating post-traumatic stress. And he calls this kind of journalism Act Two journalism. So it goes beyond the disaster to tell the story of the recovery, the stages of recovery. These stories tend to be about hope, patience, and resilience. They are also usually the product of what I call slow journalism, in which reporters give survivors time to process what has happened to them. This type of storytelling has its own effect. Research shows that the more the brain absorbs about someone, the more empathy grows. In other words, Stories deeply told, those that strive to put you in someone else's shoes, spark empathy. Grief experts say connection itself is healing. So, what about when the crises pile up 
when they come at us one after another, as they have. Is there a limit to our empathy? We don't yet know what a sustained crisis, like the pandemic, will have on our ability to be empathetic. That's because research has focused on singular disasters with a clear beginning and ending. But the Harvard professor Arthur Brooks, who is a social scientist, says we can learn from the pain of the pandemic and other traumas. He points to a phenomenon known as post-traumatic growth. Now, we've all known someone who suffered something terrible and yet later reported that time as both the worst time in their life and the best time in their life. How could that be? The trauma rocked them to the core, blew up their belief system, maybe even their worldview. They may have suffered from depression or mental illness. And yet, when post-traumatic growth came, they reported feeling transformed. They have a newfound sense of personal strength, a greater appreciation of life, and their relationships often deepen. The next time they experience loss, they do better. Now, this is a process of tremendous struggle, and it takes time. But here's the good news. As much as half to two-thirds of the people who experience a traumatic event will also experience post-traumatic growth. So, dark and distressing news can be an invitation to grow, to change, to become a better person. And what can we learn from those who suffer, from their growth, when and if it comes? The pioneering psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said this, the most beautiful people are those who have known defeat, who have known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and found their way out of the depths. How could we tune out or tune away, turn away from what they have to teach us? I'd like to leave you with my family's aftermath story. It also started with a phone call almost exactly 30 years after my brother's death. On the phone this time was an um, Air Force friend of my brother's, and this is the news that he brought us. He was in a barber shop at Hill Air Force Base, and he picked up a copy of the Hilltop Times. Inside the newspaper, were photographs and a story about an Air Force team of 72 that had cleaned up a crash site on a reservation at the request of the tribe. They'd scaled a 12,000-foot mountain known as Haystack on the Utah-Nevada border, and they spent four days and three nights removing debris that had rained down both sides of the mountain, covering 56 acres. Some of the wreckage was so large it had to be removed by helicopter. The rest filled 17 crates and weighed two and a half tons. The jet's tail hook was recovered. And so too was a pencil and a watch. It was a military-issued watch with a serial number on it. It belonged to my brother, Jim. The news of this cleanup and the photographs just lifted my family. We peered at the faces of the Air Force crew gathered around their base camp. We studied the pictures of the wreckage, and we stared at that golden mountaintop where my brother's life had ended. And we said, we have to go there.
In October 2009, my mother, my father, my brother, and I arrived in Nevada on the land of the Goshute Federated Tribe. We brought with us a thin granite marker that was inscribed with the dates of my brother's birth and death. The tribal administrator, Ed Navarajo, he greeted us. He and three other men were going to escort us to the mountain. We jumped into the tribe's Humvees and headed off for the Deep Creek Range. As we passed the powwow grounds, the youngest man in the car told us that his grandfather was herding sheep on that day in 1977 and witnessed the crash. He himself had taken the Air Force team to the site 30 years later. Our car kicked up dust as we headed higher and higher toward Haystack until suddenly we could see the crash site. 30 years had not erased the scar that the plane had made on the mountain. We pulled over, jumped out, and continued on foot, bushwhacking through the scrub until we stood in that scar. Scattered everywhere on the ground around us were small metal fragments of the airplane. We filled our pockets with them. We put our granite marker in the scar in a place that overlooked the mountains below, and then we fell silent, lost in thought. I felt comforted that my brother had come to rest in a place of such rugged beauty. The next day in the hotel at breakfast, my mother was recalling the night she was awakened in the middle of the night. It was December 3, 1977. My father was traveling, so she was home alone when those two Air Force officers knocked on her door. I watched my father as he listened to my mother. He was silent. He'd always felt such regret that he wasn't there with her on that awful night. But soon my father was recalling his own memories, and they were recent. He was thinking about the journey we had just taken. (laughs) In a single day, we had traveled back in time and across great distances, from Georgia and Missouri to Utah and Nevada, to the Goshoot Reservation, to a place called Haystack Mountain. It was, my father said, one of the best days ever. Thank you.